today's conversation on visual art and curatorial practice, part of South Asia Institute's annual symposium, South Asia Migrations and Transformations. And we're just so pleased to be co-sponsoring this program and look forward to our collaborations to come. It's especially meaningful to have this conversation here at Harvard Art Museums, where the deep history of South Asian art is represented by more than 1,200 works of art, ranging from ceremonial objects of the third millennium BCE to contemporary photography. Reflecting the region's rich and multifaceted history, these works encompass different religions, cultures, dynasties, artistic styles, media, and functions. The heart of our South Asian holdings, however, and the, the part for which Harvard is best known is surely the splendid collection of paintings and drawings created for the Hindu and Muslim courts during the early modern era. Numbering more than 700 individual objects, these works constitute the most important collection of South Asian painting and drawing in a university collection and one of the finest in any North American museum. It is really my pleasure to introduce to you Tarun Khanna, who serves as the director of South Asia Institute at Harvard. He's the Jorge Paulo Lehman Professor at the Harvard Business School, where he has taught for over two decades on entrepreneurship in emerging markets as a means of economic and social development. During his tenure with SAI, Professor Khanna has taught a university-wide course entitled Contemporary Developing Countries, Entrepreneurial Solutions to Intractable Problems, with a team of faculty from Harvard's Faculty of Arts and Sciences, Kennedy School, Business School, T.H. Chan School of Public Health, and the Graduate School of Design, who all provide multiple lenses through which to think about the salient economic and social problems of the five billion people of the developing world, and to work in a team setting towards identifying entrepreneurial solutions to such problems. He's authored several scholarly works, articles, and books, with the most notable being his 2008 Billions of Entrepreneurs, How China and India Are Reshaping Their Futures and Yours, and his 2010 Winning in Emerging Markets, A Roadmap for Strategy and Execution. So welcome, Professor Tarun Khanna. Uh, thank you. This is just a wonderful, wonderful occasion. It's nice to kick off our annual symposium. It's an excuse for us to look back on the, on the previous year and uh, uh, bring together groups of people. Um, it's always, always very exciting. This is the fifth or sixth time that we're doing it. Uh, so welcome, everybody. Um, it's a lovely, lovely start. Um, I have the, uh, the, uh, the pleasant task of introducing three panelists, um, one of whom I know uh, very well, and the other two I met recently, uh, some months ago. Uh, I'm going to start with, uh, uh, with Shazia, who I think is going to speak first. Uh, Shazia Sikandar, uh, to those of you who are um, arts aficionados, uh, she will not need much introduction. Um, she uh, studied in, in, in Pakistan, in Lahore, uh, and also got an MFA from RISD, our local uh, friendly institution and is particularly interested in Indo-Persian miniatures, um, something that's actually very close to my, uh, my heart since I collect, uh, I collect uh, miniatures from the 1800s myself. Um, um, and especially germane to uh, a big project that SAI, the South Asian Institute, is currently uh, embarked upon, which is the partition of British India, the 1947 partition of British India, since it's the 70th anniversary of that uh, epochal event, um, uh, her work on contested histories uh, seems especially important to us in informing, informing the scholarly endeavor that several of our faculty have embarked upon. So I'm looking forward to, uh, to, uh, to hearing what she has to say. I was telling her that I took my 17-year-old uh, uh, junior in high school daughter to visit colleges and uh, went to my alma mater, which is Princeton, and uh, saw one of her um, um, works exhibited there, so it was a particular treat. Um, to her left, to your right, is uh, Shanae Javeri, who is the assistant curator of South Asian art at, uh, at the Met in New York, um, uh, who also uh, comes to us from Rhode Island, so to speak, from Brown, um, where he studied uh, the history of art and subsequently completed a PhD at the Royal College of Art in London, 
um, and his, his dissertation addressed self-identity in South Asian art. Uh, Chenet is, uh, uh, is, uh, is an important part of the South Asian art intellectual spectrum, so we're very pleased that he's consented to join us and, uh, and continues to be uh, an important support for our attempt to build up this, this pro programmatic activity at SAI. Um, uh, on your extreme left uh, is the eminent Homi Baba, um, who is the Anne F. Rothenberg Professor of the Humanities in the Department of English, director of the Mahindra Humanities Center, uh, and generally is all things humanities on campus. Um, I won't say more about uh, Homi other than to just take this opportunity to thank him for his extraordinary uh, leadership and guidance and support and mentorship and friendship and so on and so forth over the last several years. Um, uh, he's just been an incredible, incredible rock and support. Uh, so with that, I will hand off to, to Homi. And uh, thank you all very much and look forward to this. to be involved every year with this conference of the South Asia Institute. Uh, Tarun has really opened up the institute um, uh, across, not only across the whole various regions of South Asia, but across the various disciplinary and indeed intellectual locations of, this, of the university itself. And I think that's a, a great achievement. And uh, he is conspicuous for the generosity with which he is, he is or welcomes uh, individuals, ideas, um, um, concepts, and conversations. And of course, initiating these and institutionalizing them are two different issues. And our friend and colleague, Mina Hewitt, uh, is also conspicuous for her creative interactions with faculty uh, and friends of the South Asia uh, Institute. Because, of course, faculty are only one part of this compact. The other part are the supporters, the trustees, the, uh, the, the donors, the gifters, to, uh, and, and the range of other um, both administrative and intellectual um, um, participations in this uh, um, project. I also want to thank you very much for the um, hospitality of this, of this lovely room and of the museum in general. So I thought I would just start by making four brief observations, after which I will ask Shazia to speak, and then Shanai, and then I'll raise some questions coming out of what they present, and then at some point we will open up to you because you're obviously very keen to have your responses and your participation in this conversation. My first issue really is, has to do with the cultural definition of migration. The SAI has fostered much work on migration. Much of it is political, social, and of course, when you think about political, social, and historical migration, the ethical issues are profound. But there is another area in which the ethical and aesthetic issues of migration come together. And these are the issues that we will be talking about today. Because all forms of migration or diasporic movements carry with them a political and historical um, uh, soil. But what gets seeded and what develops and what grows out of that soil through the process of migration is something very challenging. Because people bring with them their memories, they bring with them their art forms, they bring with them their anguish, they bring with them their hopes, and they bring with them the desire to resettle to whatever extent one can do that. Um, so they, they, people in this process of migration often have double lives. Sometimes they're tragic and sometimes they're very triumphant and celebratory. We've got to think of both. But today we will also be talking about the migration of form, of cultural and aesthetic forms. 
and the migration of cultural forms does not follow any particular national mapping. Because those of us who were brought up in India or Egypt or Bangladesh or Sri Lanka, we were the recipients of a profoundly cosmopolitan culture. You know, profoundly cosmopolitan. We were able to think very broadly in cultural terms, although we had our own locations and our own routing. So the transformation and the migration of forms, I hope, will be an issue that we might be able to talk about today. And of course, Shazia's work is very representative of this, the recreation and the migration of forms without boundaries. The curatorial challenge is increasingly a challenge which is not simply about the archival function of the museum, which is a very important function of museums, but at least in my observation, the curatorial challenge is extraordinarily creative and now even interventionist. And when I was on the jury for the Venice Biennale, I was a, a few, uh, two sessions, two uh, Biennales ago, it seemed to me that the conversations between contemporary artists and curators was something that exceeded both the realms. It opened up what I've called in my own work a third space where new sets of rules and norms of judgment or decision or shape and form get created out of that conversation. So I think curators are now very much in that creative and interventionist mode. But of course, curators depend profoundly on institutions. What is the history of the institution within which you work? If it wants to open up to South Asian art, what is the gesture of opening up? Is it merely to extend the narrative of the, of the museum, or is it to transform it? And what are the boundaries and the borders? And what is the border conversation? So I think, particularly when we think about the growing interest in South Asia and South Asian art, as indeed Chinese art, and even some of the new practices coming out of the Soviet, of, the, of Russia, I still think about it as the Soviet Union. Um, it seems to me that the curatorial role is a very significant shaping role, but when we talk about the curatorial role, I think we, we only dignify the work of our curators when we actually see them in the context of the institutions within which they can work creatively, and in some, sometimes they're constrained by it. And I think we've got to look at both, the creativity and the constraining aspects. And then finally, I just want to say that there would be no um, um, authentic conversation about art without talking about the art market. You know, and I think here um, we can be greatly enhanced in this conversation by several members of the audience, including our leader, Tarun Khanna, from the business school, who knows a thing or two about markets and entrepreneurship. And of course, the art world, now particularly with emerging art markets, is full of entrepreneurs, some good, some bad, and some terrible. And I think it would be great to understand how that kind of entrepreneurship, how the interest in particularly making new collections uh, gives is, is often driven by taste, is often driven by desire, is sometimes driven by status, and how that actually shapes an, uh, a, a, a market that is emerging. This, of course, not to say that even the more traditional art markets are also always either dying and then emerging again, so the question of entrepreneurship is not something that has to be attached only to what we call emerging markets, but I think has a longer history. Uh, then, of course, there is also the market of ideas. And here is the lowly business of the critic like myself, which is to trade in the currency of ideas. Uh, we do not persuade ourselves that we can make much of a difference, but we try hard. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's good. good afternoon, everyone. I'm deeply honored to be part of the 
annual symposium of the South Asia Institute and I appreciate this opportunity to share my work within the context of migration and transformation. I grew up Muslim in Pakistan, went to an all-girls Catholic convent school, then studied literature and math at the Kinaid College for Women, before shifting course and going to the National College of Arts in Lahore. Growing up in Pakistan in the 1980s was a deeply conflicting experience. Soviet-Afghan war was creating new social, political, and cultural ruptures. Religion was steadily becoming institutionalized. The Hudud ordinances, which limited women's rights, loomed large. Co-education dissipated. Religious tolerance diminished. Even going to an art school was thought of as immoral. At that time, in the mid-80s, as a young artist, I was intuitively seeking a catalyst for opening new territories and dialogue. It was around this time that I started questioning my calling. It was precisely the mindless malaise injected and perpetuated by the Ziaul Haq's dictatorial regime that pushed me as a young woman into the direction of art. Painting on canvas has a long history in the West. When I joined the National College of Arts, which was in the 1986-87 session, I was in an intuitive mode, seeking what would speak to me. I had no predetermined ideas or intent. I looked into architecture, photography, ceramics, printmaking, painting with equal interest. There was a prevalent emphasis on modernism and various iterations of abstract expressionism were around. I was not interested in a derivative relationship to the West via painting. Then I ran into Bashir Ahmed, who challenged my entire understanding about high and low art. His was a dedication and commitment that was rooted in tradition. Such devotion to a so-called traditional genre, like miniature painting, arrested my attention. It wasn't so much that miniature painting sparked my passion, but rather I knew that the medium had untapped potential to be a contending platform within the contemporary art world. I gravitated towards miniature painting, an anomaly amidst the highly westernized teaching methods in Pakistan at the National College of Arts at that time, a traditional art form seen then as derivative, cliched, incapable of intellectual rigor. Instinctively, I knew that that was my calling to dig deeper into miniature painting's complicated canon within historical representations. This is a time when there was very little peer support. I had pressure to reject miniature painting for its incompatibility as a contemporary idiom. And I questioned that too, because I also grew up with that sentiment that the stance of rejecting the so-called perceived inferior perhaps was indicative of a complex, deep identity crisis. During this period in the mid-late 80s, miniature painting was non-existent in the global contemporary art world as the Euro-American canon dominated the field of painting. So my first public work was the scroll painting, <coughs> which was made in 1989 to 90. It emerged as a game changer for contemporary miniature painting in Pakistan. At more than five feet, it launched a trend in making large-scale miniatures. Instead of depicting what was the norm then, a contemporary version of a traditional ritual, the scroll launched a rigorous inquiry and deconstruction of miniature painting by inserting into the thematic and traditional the intimate, personal, untranslatable, and incompatible ambiguities of youth, the flux of identity, a narrative as a moving image, and the picture plane as an infinite space. I was looking at narrative structures in film and cinema when I laid out the conceptual foundations. Perhaps it was Satyajit Ray or Hitchcock, but they were the early influences on how I juxtaposed the Safavid depiction of narrative light and the mysterious interiority of space. What followed soon after was phenomenal breakthrough for me. I was the first woman in the history of miniature painting to teach alongside the master teacher Bashir Ahmed, invited within weeks of graduating, and that directly led to the influx of other students who saw possibilities which my work pointed out. <laughs> 
I moved to the US in 1993. Humor, irony, wit, self-critique were instrumental in my dialogue with miniature. What is the process of locating one's relationship to tradition? How does ownership occur? Who owns what? What is originality? What is creativity? What is imagination? How does one create something anew? Imaginative possibilities abound within the world itself, not just within the realm of the mind. The world is full of mystery, containing within it a variety of distances between the real and the imagined. I am interested in the dynamism of form, form as something alive and in relationship to its space, technique and time. So the departures and ruptures that were introduced in my work were varied in both technique and form. By inverting the relationship of center margin, I dislocated framing devices to open up narratives of gender and identity. Artists like Eva Hesse and writers like Fatima Marnisi, Ismat Chaktai, Vislava, Manto, Langston Hughes were instrumental to my searching at that time. I was fascinated with Eva Hesse's work and life because examining her work offered a perspective from a female artist's interventions into minimalism. It allowed me to trace my own relationship with the male-dominated miniature painting field. My work started reflecting an evocative engagement with feminism and sexuality. I also became interested in cultural semiotics within religious representations as well as juxtaposing anti-classical impulses in Western art, such as mannerism with a variety of, class, of outside aesthetics. So just as an, as an example, the work that I did on the right was work I had already started doing in Pakistan. And then I started to think in terms of defacing this idea of a, of a volatile gesture. And, and I, took the, I, I took white ink and painted on top of the figure. And all I was doing was taking the ink removing all the colors, so basically the gadrang, which is like the foundation for pigment in miniature painting, uses white as the essential color and then introduces different colors into it. So I removed all the color and took the white and that white became as a as an editing tool. But as I placed the white on top of the uh, on top of the very um, archetypal form figure, the, I created a prototype of sorts but it got hijacked completely by issues around identity. And it was very interesting to see that there was so much fluctuation in what one was doing. At the same time, there was this kind of a graffiti-esque gesture which broke the preciousness of this object, which was something that I was very eager to um, engage in also. Plus, it was the androgynous notion of the self, so not necessarily just the gender in terms of male-female. Um, in Pakistan, my art had made headline news, but my first show, which was at the Pakistani embassy in Washington, D.C. in 1993, not a single work sold. So I had that time, my father had gifted me the Sea America ticket, which was by, by Delta for tourists, which turned out to be my lifeline. I packed all my paintings in a bag and used the standby ticket to travel to meet with art departments at various schools in the U.S. So my adventurous spirit found receptivity and my resourcefulness and curiosity was rewarded, rewarded at every step and soon I was accepted to start RISD's graduate program in the fall of 1993 with financial assistance that came along from various American institutions. I believe the traction that my work gained in the early to mid 90s in the art world with survey exhibitions at the Whitney um, Renaissance Society, um, I, as well as the Hirshhorn, I, I, even before I was 30 years old, was indicative of an American cultural porosity as well as the art world's desire to consume. In my experience, the multicultural melting pot idea was more of a fallacy and rightly so. In my one-on-one -on -one experiences, there was genuine desire to learn about the other, except in the pre-internet days, the burden to expand on one's cultural identity and artistic provenance was catastrophic. I recall spending hours in the library at RISD trying to curate a South Asian literary and visual framework to share in graduate seminars. Such limitations fueled my work directly, and for that alone, I was deeply grateful. I um, wanted to share some of the um, 
ideas that my work started to explore, I think there was a lot of interest in, um, in, in the representation of the female. And it was also about um, removal of, like how the removal of feminine has existed in multiple cultures, in religions, in political discourse. So some of that um, um, history obviously started to get depicted in the work at, uh, simultaneously, but the works are very dense and they have always been about uh, taking information that I am engaged in, that I'm participating in, what is happening, the interface of the community, of, of, the, of how to make work that can speak to the world. So I believe that the, in my work deals with movement and light. These are important elements in my work. And movement can be literal as in the physical crossing of geographical borders, whether it's bodies or species or commodities and resources. But movement can also be symbolic as that in the sense of belonging, as where do you belong? What are you being excluded from? So then the forms take on a very geographically determined space. There is history and storytelling happening in both sorts of works, whether they are large scale ephemeral works that I started to do, which were on, on, on walls and floors with different mediums or works which were fairly small, with, which took uh, the genre of ma illuminated manuscripts as a point of departure. But um, this idea of, of oscillating between history and storytelling was based around redaction, perceptions of authority, power hierarchies, independence. History is so important as it is constantly being rewritten in both cultural and political spheres. Why do certain visual motifs represent certain histories? Representations may not necessarily be static. Movements of objects and ideas historically because of trade and colonial occupation allowed meaning to shift as they enter different contexts. So with that in mind, I, I, I wanted to also show that I started to um, take the object itself and find ways of exploring its relationship to time and space. Um, so this, the manuscript was projected into space, and here it is uh, literally a sky in the book, uh, a book in the sky where it's uh, projected directly on trees. This, is, this image is not photoshopped. Um, and then this idea of the meta book, the notion of, 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 uh, of, of writing, the importance of writing in culture, in Islam, in um, as, as myself as an artist, I'm very interested in, in um, poetry, in literature, and thinking in terms of multiple languages, what that basically constitutes for an artist that, that has uh, straddled a traditional genre, but not bec with nostalgia, but with an objectivity, because I question, like, who, to whom does this art belong? To whom does history belong? So a, a lot of these, a lot of my work then like takes apart these notions and rebuilds them. And for me, that's very important, this idea of like, uh, unraveling to recreate, because every time you recreate, you learn something new. You, you um, embody something um, from elsewhere in the work, and then as the work um, sort of evolves, it creates its own history, its own legacy, its own baggage. And that, that also with a lot of humor and irony and wit, like uh, this work, is a series of uh, called I Am the Exact Imitation of the Original. I wanted to quickly uh, discuss one of the work that I have. Um, this work, uh, basically, um, the protagonist of, uh, of my uh, work, Parallax, has been a um, the, the this um, migrant worker from Pakistan that I met came across in UAE when I did the work for the Sharjah Art Biennial. But before I get there, I wanted to just uh, show 
another um, uh, work that I've been doing for the last several years where the East India Company is used as a, uh, as a um, migratory pattern, like a kind of a map making system where I trace its history. And, um, and we are still basically caught up in the same old patterns of inequities of wealth. Adam Smith argued against monopolies using the demise of the East India Company as a case study. So when I was working on uh, this project at the Asia Society in Hong Kong and the Maritime Museum there, I was also engaging Nick Robbins, the author of The Corporation That Changed the World, where he explains the East India Company's story as a tragedy, tragedy, enormous wealth generated with the cost of great harm. So it struck a chord, and I dressed up Adam Smith on the right in the um, garb of the East India Company, but he's, he, developed, he develops wings and he's fluttering in the economics atrium, economics building at Princeton University in the atrium. So these are permanent works which uh, have recently been installed in, um, at Princeton University, which is again a very interesting premise in terms of uh, the longevity of the work and uh, its uh, house or where does the work reside. So um, coming back to to the scroll, there was a this when I uh, there's another kind of a scroll that has happened as a sort of a departure, and that's the multi-channel multimedia work called Parallax, which has been traveling for the last several years in the U.S. and around the world. I um, it, it's a three-channel single work immersive audio video installation created from hundreds of sketches of gouache and um, scanned and layered digitally. So uh, the work was made for the 11th Sharjah Biennial, re-emerged towards a new cultural cartography. So on arrival in the UAE, one's first encounter is often with the Pakistani cab drivers. And it's impossible as a Pakistani not to be aware of the migratory labor patterns from Pakistan to the UAE. Uh, in Pakistan, the class stratification, poverty, lack of educational reform, absence of basic rights for many, deeply rooted feudal system at play, the impact of refugees from Afghanistan and the lack of social mobility have created an environment where many men seek work in the neighboring emirates to support their families. So I encountered this gentleman and we were both surprisingly shocked at our crossing paths. He was uh, living in this cinema, which was abandoned, and he had come as a laborer to build the cinema in 1976. So he, he was living there for the last so many years. This was his home. His visa was still attached to the architecture. So the building itself had been abandoned. He had originally arrived in in, as, as a migratory laborer, but had become the manager of the space. So I came in as an artist to document the space out of curiosity, because I enjoy driving, and I'd been driving. I, I was thinking of, of using the tool of driving to understand a little bit better uh, the culture that I was going to engage with. And I was thinking of drawing as a libretto for Parallax. And because drawing always, uh, dr driving always gives me a sense of mobility, independence, and competence as I establish a relationship with the place. So it, driving took on a new dimension, becoming a device with which to measure the displacement of scale. And then as I encountered this particular building, it reminded me of buildings in Karachi. So when I was so surprised that actually the building was built by in the 70s by Pakistani engineers and architects. And everything was under lock and key. The guy had not uh, um, moved anything in 10 years. And so we ended up spending a week there engaging each other. And I did the whole projections and artwork basically for him where he becomes the uh, where it's the last show for the caretaker. But this work allowed me to think about Parallax and he becomes the protagonist of that work that I end up making. Um, so I, I just wanted to express that, you know, that though um, I, I, as I encountered this space, I thought of uh, Mahmoud Darvish, I have a seat in the abandoned theater the evocative imagery of despair and the interconnected fate. 
And yet, this was spontaneous. It wasn't something I had planned. It was just the curiosity that led me three hours away from where all the art world was, was hanging out for the art biennial. Nobody was going to come and see my work three hours across the, um, um, the drive across the desert either. But these are, these are, these are things that, you know, that help uh, one um, encounter new directions in one's work. So parallax for me embodies power and conflict, but fundamentally omission and loss, and the distance that is between the real and the imagined. The building's toxicity, its lack of hospitality, it was in sharp contrast to the layers of its history, visible under the rubble and years of dust, dirt, and pigeon droppings. The posters of familiar Indian Bollywood films were ghost-like, adding a theatrical presence even in their frozen gesture. The whole thing was overwhelming in many ways, sensorially, emotionally, physically. I thought of life and of time, of tenacity and resistance, and imagined that a multi-channel piece would be immersive and cinematic in ways that would bring in the idea of the landscape and cartography. So um, th th this, perhaps I should stop here because I also wanted to show a few uh, minutes of a film. But this is the work. It was. Uh, it has been showing in various places. This is in at the Maxi Museum in Rome. So I am gonna uh, show the film. Extremely well to the two most public spaces in the building. That it invites um, contemplation, that it invites reflection, uh, that challenges, um, that they, they uh, ask us to question their, their meaning and their intent and their their symbols because they actually invite the viewer to understand what these, what these symbols mean. So they're very provocative in that way. We wanted it to stoke conversation, to remind people that we are in a world where people think of things very differently and have different cultural perspectives, um, and yet also just brought vibrancy to this, to this building. A part of each of the works is the combination of scale, materiality, and content. Um, even though relative to the glass piece, there's a lot of glass in the building, none of it is elsewhere used in the same way. Um, the, the mosaic piece is a wholly new kind of material injection into the building. Imagination is something that allows me as an artist to Call information from the past, find a link to it that links past to present, present to future. And it's also about taking ownership of narrative. And within that premise, I see uh, the act of imagination as a fundamentally political stance. What does an image mean when it's unhinged from its own representation? The drawings on paper, especially in historical miniatures, don't end at the, the edge, but hint at a narrative that continues beyond. So even if one looked at the folios of the Princeton University Library's late 16th century manuscript, that also inspired this work, you will notice that there's an aspect of infinity this is in dreaming. those drawing. Life. That idea has always been at the core of my dismantling traditional miniature paintings. I start, started to think of the iconography that is within my work and how certain elements um, have a very strong relationship to history and how some of the trenchant historical symbols I have been invested in um, resurrecting them and altering their meaning and 
shifting their context to see what type of potential there lies within them and that they can be. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to also thank SAI for bringing me here and um, to um, provide me with the opportunity to be in conversation with Homi and Shazia. My presentation is going to be quite brief, but it's just going to articulate the Metropolitan Museum of Art's relationship with South Asia and how it has developed since the inception of the museum, which will lead into some of the questions that Homi raised in terms of how curatorial agendas can work as interventionist in the context of a larger institution like the Met. So as most of you must know, the Met was established in 1870. It has um, over 17 departments and of these, and 200 million, over 200 million works of art in its collection. Of these 17 departments, eight departments actively collect and represent South Asia in their collections. So you, re, you, t you go across a range of departments from Asian art to Islamic art, photography, drawings and prints. So as you can gather from what the names have just listed, you have regionally specific and oriented departments and you have medium specific departments. And so you have a representation across you know, medium, but also in terms of broader narratives. These are just some examples from our permanent collection. Arms and armor, musical instruments. So my department, Modern and Contemporary Art, was established in 1967 by Henry Gelsaler. So we were pretty late to the game, and it is only with the coming of um, Sheena Wagstaff, the current head of Modern and Contemporary Art at the Met four years ago, well, now five, did she institute a position for a South Asian modern and contemporary art curator. Prior to Sheena's arrival, departments were working with one another and creating exhibitions. This is an example of an exhibition that was extremely successful called The Interwoven Globe, which essentially surveyed 300 years of textile. And again, it goes back to the point Homi made about how through fabrics and pieces of textile, the, oce the tra oceanic trades of oceanic routes of trade were chartered and questions of cross-fertilization of ideas and aesthetics were explicated. This is another exhibition that was done between modern and contemporary art when Sheena joined and Asian art where the contemporary works of the Cambodian artist Sophie Pick were placed alongside our historic collections. One of Sheena's first projects was to invite Imran Qureshi to do a rooftop commission where he, um, a project that he also, which he developed at the Sharjah Biennial was brought to the rooftop commission, which where you look at from, when you looked at the rooftop from afar, it looked like it was dried blood, but when you go up close to it, there were depictions of leaves, flowers, birds that were drawn from Indo-Persian miniature painting. Some of Imran's pictures were then shown alongside miniatures from our collection. So this very quick, quick summary brings, you to, brings us up to the Met Breuer, which was inaugurated last year, which is the space which we have on loan for eight years to evolve our modern and contemporary art program while we work towards raising funds and building a wing for those activities at Fifth Avenue. The Met Royal was restored with great care, and one of the inaugural exhibitions curated by Sheena was Nasreen Mohammadi. As many of you might know, this was Nasreen's first international retrospective, and it presented her to an international audience. What it did in the context of the Met was that it situated it, it articulated one strand of programming that the modern and contemporary department is committed to, which is looking at a history of global art and reconsidering positions that have been established. Nasreen, is, uh, Nasreen was an uh, artist who practiced in Baroda in the 70s and 80s. She passed away in 1989 and is mostly known for her graphic and minimal representation, non-representational works. The exhibition also brought in um, her photography, which was less known. 
these are some installation views. Nasreen's exhibition was complemented with an artist in residency program with the musician Vijay Iyer, who um, composed music to engage with her drawings, but also had a live performance program that ran the course of the exhibition. This now brings me to the juncture when I joined the museum. So prior to joining the museum, I was working as an independent writer and curator. And um, I graduated from Brown University with um, a concentration in film studies and art history, and then was doing my PhD at the Royal College of Art. But while working as a academic, I also was pursuing independent writing and scholarship. And one of my first projects was to look at a history of cross-cultural exchange between India and the West post-independence in the visual arts, which led to the first book that I co which I edited, which was an anthology of essays about European filmmakers who had made films in or on India. These films at the moment when I did the book had been overlooked not only within the overs of their respective filmmakers, but also within this larger art history of India and the international, and that dimension of cross-cultural exchange is something that I wanted to mine. It eventually then went to become a film program at the Tate Modern, which was when I initially met Sheena. This led to my second book, which further expanded the remit of my investigations, which went into looking at art and design and moving between micro and macro narratives. When I mean macro narratives, the book explores the establishment of institutions in India under Nehru's spirited regime of cosmopolitanism, but also the circulation of exhibitions and art objects in India from the West. So MoMA at that time as an institution was particularly active and sent many exhibitions of art and design to India. This was complemented with interviews and a focus on particular bodies of work by Western artists who had spent time in India. This followed on to an exhibition that I curated at the Palais de Tokyo, which was called Companionable Silences. And this exhibition, again, evolved these ideas of a transnational art history or a migration of forms and aesthetic experiences. It looked at the lives and works of a group of non-Western women artists who had spent time in Paris from the 1920s to the 1960s. And who were self-consciously investigating not only their place in Paris at that time, but also aesthetic and formal references of modernism that they were being taught. This painting by Amrita Shergiv was really the inception for that exhibition, and I think it is one of those iconic works of art which very self-consciously investigates paradigms of representation and, the, and questions of the exotic. Other artists who included in this exhibition were Tarsila do Amaral, Saluara do Juquer, Zarina Hashmi. So the, this was the kind of work that I was pursuing prior to joining the museum. My responsibility at the museum is twofold. One is to contribute to the ongoing exhibition program at Breuer, and the other is to build the museum's collections or evolve its holdings of South Asian modern and contemporary art. Prior to my joining, the museum's holdings from the region from 1900 were modest, to say the least. It was a blind spot, as was a number of, as was the modern and contemporary. The modern and contemporary department, prior to Sheena's arrival, was not very active in building collections, and the international remained a particular blind spot. And I think. So my first task when arriving was to evolve a collection strategy that would articulate how one would, in 2016, look back at 116 years of modern and contemporary art and articulate this for audiences. The question, and also keep, keeping in mind our historic collections. So the question I essentially raised is that when the Met was building its historic collection, the terms of engagement with the world were very different. Its place as an institution was very different. To expect that those terms and conditions could be replicated in 2016 when engaging with South Asia would not be possible. I affirm that it would not be possible to produce or create a 
encyclopedic or comprehensive collection of South Asian art. The strategy I feel which one needs to engage with is building a collection that is necessarily fragmented and will tell particular kinds of narratives or stories or cluster and bring clusters of artists together who suggest who are suggestive of certain concerns that the museum should engage with at this present moment. So some of the artists who've entered the collection under such an approach are Zarina Hashmi, who has led an extremely transnational life and has engaged with ideas of the minimal and also of exile and displacement. We have Rashid Arain, who is another Pakistani artist who lives and works in London and has engaged with the modernist but moved into contemporary practice, engaging with ideas of minimalism, but also was um, is extremely has been a politically engaged artist in talking about the third world and the marginalization of third world artists. We have a work by Rashid Rana. We have a contemporary work by Prabhavati Mepayal who extends the concerns of minimal and non-representational works of art, which was inaugurated with Sheena's interest with Nasreen Mohammadi. Nasreen Mohammadi also as a figure articulates a transnational form of experience. Though she was born in India, she was educated in England and was drawing from both Eastern and Western references when evolving her spare and grid-like works. We, we do have a work by her, but unfortunately it hasn't yet been photographed, which so hence I couldn't, hence I can't present it to you. Anwar Jalal Shremza, another artist who has led a transnational life, Pakistani, who moved to England and lived out his life there, passing away in 1985, evolving a more calligraphic form of abstraction. So along with this trajectory of the transnational, I instituted or have instituted another form of collecting, which is around a group of artists who are engaging with the idea of the living traditions of India. So artists who work, who are actively looking at bifocally, not only Western modernist agendas, but also historical arts and crafts traditions. And a figure pivotal to this art history is K.G. Subramaniam. K.G. Subramaniam was an artist who was trained in Shantaniketan and then became a pedagogue at Baroda. So besides being an influential artist in his own right who worked across various mediums and challenged not only Western forms of representation and Western histories of painting, so as you can see in this work, actively ungridding the idea of the studio portrait and bringing in a kind of coarseness in his painting and a sense of abstraction and further evolving it through a group of paper works. He also encouraged a generation of artists to work with non-traditional materials that were rooted within an Indian vernacular of expression. And artists who came out of that kind of pedagogy are Nilima Sheikh, Mirnalini Mukherjee, and Sheila Gowda, who are practicing today. So complementary to a strand of collecting that thinks of the transnational and looks at a, 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 a more minimalist vocabulary of representation that tethers to Western modes of expression, I felt it was necessary to look at another group of artists who are looking at the living traditions of India and how they were inflecting that within their collection. And a third group which is being initiated, which I think goes back to what our symposium today is dealing with, which is the idea of migration, but not in culturally terms, but in ethical and moral terms. So a group of work that talks about the social and cultural conditions that are impacting the region today. And so works that have a politicized orientation and take a partisan view. It will also force the museum to articulate a position in relation to what is happening in the region today, which is a responsibility that needs to be extended if it chooses to bring in work from the region today. And finally, um, just to say that along with the collection building, which will have to be integrated in our permanent gallery displays, exhibitions and monographic exhibitions continue to be a parallel strand of edification. So we have a show of Raghubir Singh, a monographic show of his, which will open at the Met Broyer 
this fall. And then in next fall, we'll have another monographic show of an Indian female artist who will carry on this question of the modern to the contemporary. And I'm just going to leave it there so that we can dive into the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Shazia and Shanae, for these very illuminating and uh, engaged presentations. How long do we have? 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Um, in that case, maybe I would open up directly <coughs> to the audience and take some of your questions and use those questions to make further reflections on what has been uh, presented. So could I have a question from somewhere and somebody? Yes, so please. So somebody in their uh, Now, my friend there said, what, what should I tell the people? To wait for the mic, right? Yes, yes, yes wait sir. for the mic. Uh, somebody in the opening comments uh, talked about constraints uh, to creativity, not just opportunities for it. So I wonder if. Uh, both Shazia and Shanae could comment on constraints. And the constraints that I imagined I heard in your, in your opening comments were constraints in Pakistan when you were growing up, uh, upon you, I'm imagining. Um, and perhaps in your case, the constraints that the Met imposes on you currently as a result of its own idiosyncratic histories. Uh, that must be related to some of the ways in which you imagine your own ongoing work. So I'd love to hear something on that. Yeah, I raised this question of constraints in in both in the, transform the transformative uh, structure of t bringing things from one place to another or one medium to another, but also, as I said, the creativity of the curatorial intervention, but then the constraints within which you have to work. Well, um, I, I, I believe that the constraints um, are actually fodder for me. And as an artist, uh, it's very much uh, a, a process of, uh, of um, unpacking and um, using the restrictions or the confinement to think of art as a um, problem-solving system. Like that, that's, uh, that's a very creative way of like, um, of, of straddling all of it, whether it's the work at hand, whether it's an exhibition, or whether it's the history of, of the work, of the practice too. I think there are many dimensions in there, which is, uh, as, a, as I, I, I definitely strongly believe that for women, the support is far less. Uh, it, within the arts, the representation shifts dr dramatically in, in your mid-career. And um, these are known facts, and I think those those types of restrictions, I, I question like how do they get um, addressed in museums and institutions? From afar, one is aware that they they are getting maybe better a little bit here and there, but when you go out and you see survey exhibitions, they're far and few, if any, of of uh, of women artists in in major institutions. So all of these things become instrumental in, in one's practice and one how, wh wh what is one's community? Like what is the larger um, practice of making art? And where, what are the interfaces that one's work is constantly engaged with and is trying to push those boundaries and shift the dynamics and, and as well as be inspired. Being inspired as a whole a lot of responsibility in of itself, you know. So the, it's, a, it's all woven in. That's, yeah. uh, that's how I can best No, that, that's interesting it. because there are some constraints, like the gender constraint that you're talking about, uh, which has institutional implications, career implications, and must in some way also, because of the first two, affect the construction of a practice. Yes. Um, and that's something, a con constraint that is shared, you know, in many different st structures, systems, institutions, and practices is the gender constraint. Then, of course, you're saying, on the other hand, 
other forms of constraint, political censorship, might actually, if you can work around it, might produce a much richer work than uh, a work that is allowed to present its politics, you know, simply on the surface of the work. So I, so I, I so let's keep that conversation going, should I? I think um, I did touch upon it a little bit, very briefly, when speaking. But um, in terms of the Met, particularly, and my role there, I wouldn't say it's a constraint, but something that one has to respond to or recognize is the chronology the institution has lined up for itself in the way it has collected and what it has chosen to collect. And now that it is making a foray to engage with the region in the modern and contemporary, how, do you, how does one handle that question of chronology? And I think to what Shazia said, you can use that in a creative manner and the strategy that I think, rather than just going out there and trying to, what could maybe result in a more dilettantish approach, take something or set up something that is necessarily fragmented, which works with ideas and which tells off particular kind of dynamic strategies. And what it then allows, at least the way I see it to do, is a performance of art history, because not only are you able to perform to an art history or against an art history that you have received that is one of an institution, but then one of your region as well. So you can nimbly work between the two and perhaps find ways to asunder the gap or at least create responses to how we think about the gap that exists between international art histories, institutional art histories, and regional art histories. So here, the constraint would be the gap you have to deal with, and the constraint would be the fact that you have a whole long history which has established a particular way of looking at art, collecting art, art objects, and creating the narratives of value Yes. These are narratives of value for the institution. This is not just an educational or pedagogical or performative or artistic thing. They construct the value of the Met, this yeah. kind of encyclopedic. You know, in the encyclopedic is not in its structural form. It's a cultural value, a civilizational value. Yeah. And if you start after, once that is established, then as I understand you, the problem is not to be obsessed with filling gaps that you can never fill because it's a different history, but actually taking the gap or taking the fact that these collections are dramatically incomplete, except in the classical sense, yes. where they are very cosmopolitan, then how do you begin uh, again? And where do, you, where do you start from? And that's where you have constructed your th three narratives, the transnational, then the more regional, and I can't remember. And one which is the contemporary, the contemporary which, which actually speaks to contemporary. Partisan in a partisan way, yeah. that the artists who take one position or another position and tell a very particular political story. And hopefully the three strands will reflect back on the institution and the history that it has laid out for itself. So it is, being, it is initiating a, conver a conversation with itself. So it's what was, would that mean? I mean, would that mean, for instance, and I like this idea of of, of, of something that you're doing in a belated sense once the foundations have been set, really making you rethink the earlier thing. Would that make then a way of thinking about classical art, which is so often a formal uh, art historical and aesthetic understanding, to opening up that, the notion of the classical to the fact that in pre-national terms, there was a huge exchange of forms and languages. Would that be the kind of thing? So yes. that somebody would then rethink those galleries and it, their histories in different ways. Exactly, and I think that Shazi has actually been part of a project hmm. that the museum did do, which was called the Artist Project, where we invited artists into the Met to choose an object from the collection and ruminate on it, why it is something that engages them, inspires them, or moves them. And I think that's one way of going to rethinking or reanimating a relationship to it. Another way is looking at an artist like Nasreen Mohammadi, whose references were culturally extremely diverse, but again, reconsidering them within a modernist paradigm. 
and one that was made in a non-Western context that sits outside of Western art history of the modern. So you have, again, a figure who kind of is working transnationally, but also is looking at his, she's looking at calligraphy, she's looking at textiles, she's looking at modernist buildings as well. So in the way the artists and the artworks can help us reimagine that art history. Thank you. Let's have another question and then parry it around. Yes, the gentleman with the beard there. Yes, you. Yes, you. Do you have a question? I know I thought you were saying something to your uh, to the person next to you, so I thought that might make a good question for us. <laughs> Come up one. Come I think up with one. There's a question on this side. Come up with one. Yes, uh, great. I like these these spontaneous questions. Come up with one. All right. Thank you very much. Hi. Well, first of all, I'm a very early fan of your work. Before you became a global star. A um, long time ago, um, I was curious about how um, the images that you use, particularly in the earlier stuff, um, the female form and merging it with other um, uh, sort of symbols. Right in the beginning, when you brought that out onto the international stage, how was that received? Was there some confusion around it? Was there uh, were there meanings associated with it that you weren't comfortable with? Um, and is, as an artist, do you feel that there is any kind of space for you to actually steer uh, the way the work is being interpreted? I was actually going to come ask you this after the talk, but like, <laughs> and then relate it all to my own work. But <laughs> you know, it's very interesting that um, a lot of my work from the mid-90s is in storage. I've never published it. I, at that time, was not very comfortable showing that work. I, I, it wasn't what was perhaps expected of me. And I felt that I wanted to hold on to the work that others did not fully engage with. Like, I deserve to hold on to my work idea. And I th it was very interesting because it was, um, it was happening simultaneously. To, uh, to, to the miniature painting work that I was doing. It was, in, it was being informed by, by, by that same process. So, uh, so it was connected, but visually it, it was pretty different. And thus um, it felt like I needed to explore it further. And so some, some characters from that work enter the stage of miniature painting. And I think at that time these are forms that are emerging out of uh, questioning the history of that genre. So the representations that I'm looking at are, say, for example, in Kangra painting. The, the representation of the feminine is always um, in, in context to what has not yet happened. Either she's awaiting um, her lover, or she's awaiting something that has yet to happen that's going to have an impact on it. So that those those things were very visually, very much illustrated, il illustrative. But at an abstract level, these ideas were uh, were pretty much um, were profound because they, they this representation of the female was what I was trying to understand. So eventually, you know, I think one of the uh, examples would be the removal of the female form and leaving just the silhouette of the hair and then using that, I, that motif as a particle system and writing codes where it has been exhibited on, you know, on, 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 in Times Square where it becomes like a engine in of itself where the narrative has been unhinged and the female narrative is now free to create its own representation. So at that time, I do not hide what, where the source is coming from. I was very interested in transparency and sharing everything and yet being able to find ways to um, give a buoyancy to the form so that the form is connected to its history, its difference is very much in place, and yet it is able to conjure up multiple endless new associations. 
So how does, wh what does that kind of mean? And I think some of that early work hints at that in a different manner, where the f body is connected to itself through roots or they are, they're, it's headless. That, so that, for me, the beheading of the female is a very dramatic, drastic image. It is the expunging of the feminine from, uh, from a lot of religion. It's interesting when, when you say that, I was thinking about the way in which the, you know, that white overpainting mm -hmm. um, uh, over traditional forms where you, where you have these long entrails reminded me so much of Eva Hesse. Mm -hmm. You know, the, and because the way in which these, like in her work, and you mentioned Eva Hesse there, the way in which these long entrails then connect to something else and something else. And they actually, uh, both in the scalar terms, and in narrative terms, they completely change the thing that they're painted over. So effectively, there are two works. I think when I've written about your work, I've often talked about the layering and the way in which the layering is like a palimpsest. You see the original tradition, miniature tradition, then you see something else about it, then you see the way in which the frame is infracted. I mean, in two or three of these works, you show that there's stuff happening outside the frame in a completely different visual and semiotic vocabulary than what is happening inside the frame. So in, 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 in that, taking that from our generous and spontaneous questioner's uh, perspective, taking that issue and talking about the range of um, both internal and external sources that, that are part of such a work, I really begin to, I want to use that to put a question to you, Shanai. Uh, with, great, with, with great understanding for what you do, I sometimes wonder whether categories like the transnational are the right ones. Just like I often, I mean, I always think that there is a way in which people talk about the global as if it exists, you know, it is there. I think whether it's a work is transnational or not, and I'm just thinking about, uh, about Shazia describing her practice, it can be led, you know, the, the crossing of a cultural boundary can become one moment in, a, in the syntax of a sentence or in the syntax of a visual thing. So the question really is whether, and this is something to do with I'm just, something I wrote, I've been writing recently, and is whether you should ask the question of whether something is transnational or not, whatever that means, as a process, exactly. rather than this notion that there is a default condition, that we live in a global age. You know, this is some kind of epochal truth, which half the time is complete bull. You know, it, it, it really doesn't hold up at all. You know, what does it mean? There are various trajectories that make certain linkages. Now, do you want to necessarily emphasize the national aspect of it by calling it transnational? Or do you want to think more about translational relations? And why should we make the national be the dominant signifier of this crossing of the boundary? So this is just a question, really. Yeah, no, and I, I think that two things which I'd like to say to that is that it's very much, and um, it, I agree with you very much that it's about an iterative process that takes place across different geographies and different historical moments. So the transnational becomes a route through rather than a definitive condition or place. And that's what I was trying to suggest through the Palette of Tokyo show was that for these women who passed through Paris, what was the kind of pedagogy they took on or reacted against when they moved forward. Similarly, with a number of the artists who I brought into the collection and we're looking to bring in from Zarina to Rashid Arain to Shemza to KG Subramaniam, there is always the question of rootedness or a, 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 a conversation with that. And that's something which I've written about a lot in my own work outside of the museum. Bhupen Kakar is another artist who I've done most of my PhD on and written about who exemplifies this idea of working from a very specific place but engaging with the global or the cosmopolitan in a very different way. And so I think that the suggestion is through bringing in this group of artists who I've, who I've um, managed to you know, identify for the museum is to 
is to suggest it not as a definitive condition, but as, part, as, as people having these longer processes. So to that, I'd just like to say, therefore, that one term that we have not mentioned and that's important to me and we won't be able to discuss is how you characterize transition. You know, because the show of at the Palais de Tokyo of, thing, of, of, thing, of people working through. But the concept of transition, which is as much a constructed critical concept as beginning, middle, or end, yeah. or rootedness or non-rootedness, that, I think, is something that really needs a lot of thinking about, not only aesthetically, but institutionally. What happens in the middle? And how do we hold on to that? Because we always want to see a transformation. We want to somehow get to the end of the process. But the great gift in the arts is there is no end to the process. Yeah. The, the only end to the process is when somebody asks another question, which changes the very terms of the work. Do we have time? And just to elaborate on that, a way that I think, and I'm not sure if this is the answer, but the way I'm thinking that one could suggest that is the representation of the artist in a collection not by a singular work but by different bodies of work from different moments of the practice that of the specific practice of the specific practice so similarly like from the two works of kg subramaniam or the two works of mirnali mukherjee where you see them move from me from from medium to medium or from representation to other kinds of modes of articulation i think some, something could be suggested through that mm. rather than just the definitive the work. iconic work yeah. that is isolated and spotlight, spotlit on a wall. And there is also this question of, you know, and I think of Zarina Hashmi, when I wrote about her work of two or three years ago, one of the things that was very important in, in, to me was that when she went to Japan in her, you know, in her journey, which yeah. took her to many places, and when she said, you know, when she learned how to, that the, the, uh, the, the translational, or if you want to call it transnational, I have some problems with that, but the yeah. translational moment was not the image she produced in Japan, but how she learned to put a pressure on the wooden block. That act of putting the pressure, not the image that emerged, was actually the moment of the intersection of different cultures. So she was using Sangana paper mm. on the one hand, which is a long Mughal connection, I think, and then just how much pressure she was taught to put to create the print. Those are the kind of issues of a cosmopolitanism of practice, not of whether something is semiotically cosmopolitan mm. or not, I think is really quite important. I wanted to ask you about the, um, the way in which, for both of you, architecture is important. For you, in an installation work, the, in the work speaks to, makes an intervention within a particular building, whether it's the economics department at, uh, at, uh, at Princeton or the cinema theater, which I, that, that work I really like, the cinema theater work a great deal. And for you, the building is also the house of the work. It's the home of the work. And therefore, to go back to what Tarun was saying, create certain constraints uh, and certain possibilities. So from your perspective as an artist who has to make these installation works, and from yours as a curator, what is the role of architecture? Well, I, I have been very influenced by architecture for a while. Louis Kahn's work, looking, looking at Nayir Ali Dada's work also, like growing up in terms of like wanting to be an architect mm. initially, mm. like that's how I went to an art school. I, I, and understanding like, you know, how does architecture come into play? in a culture, in a society. It's a very active, it has so much mobility. And so I don't think more in terms of architecture as a theater for the projection of my work. I think in terms of its language, I also think that I'm always wanting to get outside of the architecture. 
So that's why the projections were in, to, in space. They were not necessarily limited to be placed, projected on the facade of a building or the interiority of a building. But what about the glasswork in Princeton? The glasswork at Princeton is a permanent work. Mm -hmm. So just that, they have Lewis Nevelson. They have, they, they have, if you look at the, <laughs> the representation of permanent works mm -hmm. by women mm -hmm. artists in their, collect, mm -hmm. in their permanent uh, campus works, mm -hmm. it was a big deal for me. Also, it was a um, it won the, the proposal one. So I, I was thinking more in terms of the context of Woodrow Wilson, f uh, foreign um, um, international policies, the context of the econ larger economics global idea. Mm -hmm. So the, there's a forum and the international atrium where how the world perceives Princeton and how its image is projected. So for that, you know, for me to have inserted the motif of Mirage in one of the main buildings. That was, it, it, for me, that was very interest, very much personal because it's, a, it's, about, it's about the inspiration behind it, about imagination, about flight, but it also is a very po political image. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that um, was rendered in, in a, a white gold. So when the, there's light in the space, it lit, lights up. And when it's, uh, there's lack of, of light throughout the day, it recedes as a black hole. So these concepts, you know, the, the, the idea of the motif is alive. How is it connected to its history is very important. Right. Not just through the institution. I'm looking at, I'm digging into the manuscripts. Sure. So, the, so architecture is an institution. And that's why at the Woodrow Wilson School, they're having a lot of issues at Princeton, as you know about Woodrow Wilson. Somebody just came to see me the other day, an architect who was trying to work out a project there and to discuss with me how they, you know, what, how, what kind of intervention could they make to be able to do a kind of critique of Woodrow Wilson while actually being in the shadow of the school. This has its, you know, academic ironies, but they're good ironies to have. And what about you, um, Shanae, in terms of uh, working with certain spaces that are given to you? So the Met at Fifth Avenue and the Met Royer are very distinct buildings. Yeah. One's a Beaux-Arts building with the grand staircase, which you ascend to right. the Temple of Knowledge. And then the other is one where there's a bridge and there's a break from the city and you move into a space of contemplation. And that building also comes with its own history of being the Whitney as mm. well, but it's so circumscribed in its character as a building. Mm -hmm. So one is how you think about what kind of work you will choose to program in it. So I thought Nasreen was a very inspired choice mm -hmm. for the Broyer mm -hmm. building because not only was she working concurrently to the time when that aesthetic idiom was being formulated, not only by Broyer, but in itself was had tr a large attraction, but it also it mirrored the building and articulated it in interesting ways. The, one of the distinctive features about Breuer is the, is the gridded mm. ceilings and the perspectival windows, mm. which found wonderful consonance or resonance mm. in her works as well. Mm. So similarly, I think going forward, looking at work that one would display, it would either one has to consider the theatrics of that building mm. and whether it would be in consonance or would it be in confrontation with it. And the latter could be very productive mm -hmm. as well in rethinking or recasting works of art, which have been probably seen in one particular way. In a show which maybe didn't engage with South Asia, but was the other opening show of the building, which was called Unfinished, which is where works by Titian and El Greco were brought from Breuer and from other haloed institutions. I mean, not from Breuer, so from Fifth Avenue to Breuer. And I was listening to Andrea Breuer, who was the co-curator who works in European painting, and she's saying historically these paintings would be held up much higher and your vantage point would be tilted up, but because of Breuer, they were brought down. So the structure of the building changed the relationship to the picture and the sense of perception. So I think there are great creative possibilities, but one has to be attuned to those. Going to Fifth Avenue, you're less, the constraints are greater, but, and there the real estate is much smaller as well. And I think there, the galleries can be reanimated in ways by working interdepartmentally and bringing things to parts of the museum which had never been 
there before, and that could be prompted through an artist's interest in a particular object, because we had so many modern and contemporary artists looking at things in various other departments, which we would maybe never have considered. So maybe a more interdepartmental engagement that breaks down the established geographies within Fifth Avenue could be very productive. So that point is one that has a long history of you know bringing artists. I remember in Venice, Mona Hatoum doing interventions, and you know, there are many yeah. such. But the previous point you make is actually very interesting. How you change the sight line and you change the angle of vision because of the lower, uh, because of the because they're hung lower, yeah. and so Titian has a very different scalar relation to the viewer, and the viewer participates and reads the work very differently. I think but in figurative art, that must be a, uh, you know, a very interesting work. It's like the Californian um, uh, sculptor who, who changes the scale of all the figures. You know, what's he called? The man in, in, the, in Venice at the... Charles Ray. Yeah. Uh, Charles? Charles Ray. No, Charles Ray, yeah, yeah exactly. Who, always changes, you know. You have <coughs> whole families who are more or less, they're more or less the same, they look as if they're the same size, but they're of completely different generations. Charles Ray's work, I think, also plays with that. That's very interesting. I think we have, uh, we've, one last. one last question. I, I wanted to say one thing. Yeah. I had a question. Um, uh, we were talking about um, the histories that are hard to fill those gaps. But like as an artist, I, I've often wondered like the provenance of miniature painting is so um, difficult to understand because it, 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 it's so much of it of the art is attributed to artists that may mm. have been mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. may not have been. Mm. So to resurrect a dead miniature painter and then um, make a relationship, say, with El Greco. So, like, Farouk Chela and El Greco are born around the same time, and but to have a conversation between them would be such an interesting idea to counter some of the historical narratives. So, th things of that nature, I would love to see exhibit, but exhibitions, like, institutions never take risks of that nature. They often will put this context of South Asia or the larger Asian idea within the accepted Asian role. Look, I, I believe very much that taking things out of context changes our whole notion of context. So I'm very much with that. But I think there is a danger, not mm -hmm. in what you're saying, that very often it's a very easy thing to say, if I put this with that, there will be a conversation. What the terms of that conversation uh, is, is how to set the terms of the conversation. Because cultural pluralism is always saying, put this in front of that and that in front of that, and that we're also generous, loving, cosmopolitan people. Bullshit. Unless you set the terms of that conversation very carefully, people have been trying to do this all the yeah. time. But I, I was thinking Farouk Chela because I had a conversation with uh, the historian mm. John Saylor that Farouk, when you look at Farouk Chela's work or the work attributed to Farouk, a Farouk Chela, you see there is the similar kind of a jagged uh, fluorescent, jagged edge, jagged line, fluorescent color that is kind of, you, you can completely see that in El Greco's work too. So they could have been, you, you know, you, so as an artist, I can definitely take that liberty to resurrect yeah. them and have a th three-way conversation True. with the three but artists. But the danger is to say, because they look alike, they are alike. Because no, they're, they're not alike, but they're born around the same period. Yeah. So, to, But through that conversation and partnership with art historians, to like question some of the... Uh, some of the crossovers, this idea of plurality, which has existed throughout throughout India's history. If you look at Deccan work, it had a lot of it had a lot of plurality also. But then, how contemporary conditions are now under transnationalism uh, categories considered more plural? But there were moments of plurality, which are worth excavating. Yeah, no, I, I I have problems with plurality. Okay. But anyway, <laughs> no. I was just I was just going to say what you what you raised in terms of like uh, 
the question of the morphological comparison yes. between works. And that's not, I have tried to engage with this in shows that I've done and posited them as experiments, which, are, which were not done at the, under the aegis of the Met, but when I was working independently, I brought Lionel Wendt and Amrita Shergill together based on mm. similar, a similar proposition, which is both were modernist artists, but working in different mediums, working in a region, and came from mixed parent bag, backgrounds. So biographically very consonant, you know, both died young, both had, you know, their, their, their chosen subject matter. When just tell people back. a little bit about Wendt and, oh, and just Lionel Wendt was a sentence. Sri Lankan photographer yeah. who descended from the Burger community and um, was a trained lawyer and pianist, but chose to go back to Colombo in the 1920s and was an active proponent of the modern art movement. And in the 30s, took up the camera and was experimenting with a number of modernist techniques, including a lot of surreal vocabulary, a lot of surrealist voca vocabulary attributed to surrealism, and also engaged in a lot of nude studio photography, which was quite progressive for that moment. So thinking of the kind of modernity project he was initiating in Sri Lanka, while Amrita Shergill is in India looking at Ajanta paintings and Paul Gauguin, and the modernity project that she's engaging, in two different mediums, but they're both looking at the, peop the respective peoples of their country and representing them in their work, but through the overlay of biography. So I, I very much am sympathetic to that idea, but I think that it's about the tomes of engagement because it's it, the, the great challenges when you put works that have similar visual, visual formalities, yes. the people tend to look at them in morphological relation to one another, and then inevitably a power hierarchy de generates where one becomes derivative of the sure. other, which is, which, and that's where creative curatorial interventionism needs to come in to articulate positions and present them I think to that's my, exactly my point, because very often on that basis, you get a kind of pluralist universalism which I think is a real problem. Yeah. I wanted to just clarify that I was talking in, the, in particular about the provenance of miniature painting. Mm -hmm. yes. Because m a lot of it is not archived. A lot of it is based, is attributed to yeah. so-called yeah. artists mm. that may have existed or not. Right. right. That's a very different uh, history from Western art history. No, that is a very different issue. Because but then you're like deter you're giving names, you're creating names and attributing work to artists. It is very different. But look at the great Bruegel in Brussels. Look at the Icarus painting. For a long time, people thought it was Bruegel. Now they have real doubts. And books and books and tomes have been written about it as one of the great original Bruegels. I've even done something halfway there, <laughs> but for a very different reason, not for art historical reasons. But look, this has been a very fascinating discussion, and I really want to thank you both and, uh, for being here and for participating. And I want to thank our audience for, a, for excellent participation and my friend there for jumping in <laughs> so valiantly. And Mina and Tarun and all of you, thank you so much for your presence. See you next year. Bye. Thank you.